there, everybody. Today's class is on the history of cheese making. Um, I am Juana Isabella de Montoya Ejimenez. I live in the West Kingdom. I'm um, a Duchess and a Laurel and a Pelican. Um, I've been a Laurel primarily for cooking for over 40 years. I um, have been making cheese for about 10 years. One of my former apprentices, Mistress Evelyn, when she was my apprentice, taught me how to make cheese. She's here today, and I know she's out there somewhere. Um, yes, laurels learn from their apprentices as well as the other way around. That's, that's a good thing. Um, I live in San Francisco. I am in a city. I do not have dairying critters. Um, some of you may live in more rural environments and have access to actual critters that you can milk, but the animal husbandry aspect of cheese making, I only know from books and from visiting farms, but no actual practical. Yeah, but it's fine. Animal. They're better, they're better off getting better pictures, you know. Ooh, somebody is not muted. I don't know who it is, but they are um, now muted. Okay, now they're muted. Um, so now you know who I am and some of what my credentials and so on are, uh, so we can get started. I'm going to borrow Mistress Eulalia's phrase. She says that um, in her pie making class that modern flour is as period as a cell phone. Well, the same thing applies to modern cheese. It is as period as a cell phone. Um, all cheeses, they're, you know, thousands of varieties of cheese on this planet. It's a marvelous thing. Cheese. Anyway, all cheese is basically made of four things, milk, coagulant, culture, and salt. And of those four, since the time period that the SCA looks at, salt's the one that's changed the least because NACL is NACL is NACL uh, with minor variations depending on where you got it and a little bit of mineral content, but it's still, it's salt. Milk, however, which is the main constituent in your cheese, um, Louis Pasteur was not even a glint in his grandfather's eye during period. So all period cheese is raw milk cheese. Very little of modern cheese, at least modern cheese in the US. In other countries, they have other rules, but in the US, most cheese you buy in a cheese shop is made from pasteurized milk. Um, and those two things behave very, very differently. And if you haven't played with raw milk, which I know some people can and some people can't. California, we can buy raw milk. Other states, you cannot or at all. And some you're there are little workarounds, like you buy a share in a cow and you can get raw milk. If you live in a place where you can't get raw milk, that's unfortunate. If you live in a state that's, you know, it's one of those Eastern states and they're all small, you can go across state lines and get raw milk, do it at least once in a while. Um, because once you have played with raw milk, you will understand how people figured out how to make cheese because raw milk just turns into cheese pretty much by itself. It's really easy. And when you've only played with pasteurized milk, that's kind of a revelation. Um, but we will get back to milk in a little bit. Um, the other things, coagulant, which can be uh, with many fresh, not all of them, but many fresh cheeses. Oh, look, I can help. Somebody else. Um, a lot of fresh cheeses are acid set cheeses. So lemon juice, vinegar, citric acid, those sorts of things tend to be fresh cheeses or you coagulate with rennet. Um, and modern rennet is usually a genetically modified byproduct uh, product of, of you know, things that are grown in a lab to make a vegetarian rennet because actual rennet um, comes from the enzymes in the stomach 
of an unweaned ruminant. So you kill a baby cow before you weed it. Takes to her, it's tiny, and he's with it. But so that commercial cheese nowadays is vegetarian acceptable, they use a vegetarian version of rennet. So that is another difference between modern commercial cheese and period cheese. So there were vegetable rennets in period. Um, the other one, oh, culture, yes, cultures. Most hobbyist cheesemakers like me, uh, when you use the cultures you use and you're making your cheese are these freeze dried little powders, packets that you get from the cheese making supply stores. And it's a single culture in each little packet. In cheese making that is, in period cheese making, it was usually um, a colony of different cultures rather than a monoculture, sort of like, you know, monoculture in cropping in, in farms nowadays, you know, as opposed to period farming where you'd have lots of different things growing at the same time. Same thing on a microscopic level with the cultures. You would have a variety of them all happily living in a little community that would do fun things with your milk and your cheese. Um, you can combine in modern hobbyist practice of cheese making, you can combine more than one culture in your cheese making. Um, but they're not necessarily ones that would have grown together in period. Also, obviously, cheese makers in period did not have little foil packets of freeze dried culture. <laughs> Obviously not, doesn't have that technology. Um, so the cheese, make, the bacteria, some of it came with the milk out of the cow. It's part of the microbiome of the cow or goat or sheep or whatever. Just like you have a microbiome in your gut, so do all the other critters. Um, and that provides some of the bacteria, the cultures, not all bacteria is bad. One thing cheesemakers know that not all bacteria is bad. You need it to make your cheese. Anybody who does fermentation of any sort knows that not all bacteria is bad. Um, so it could be in the milk naturally as it came out of the animal. It could be in the equipment you used, which is why frequently um, cheeses made in one place it's always the same kind of cheese because they have the same cultures in their equipment or in their aging space. It's so Emmental is made in Emmental and that's where those cultures live. They're in everything that is in the cheese making process. But one of the, <clears throat> one thing when I tell people that I make cheese, they always, oh, what kind do you make? you're a hobbyist as opposed to a professional, you can make all different kinds because you do other things in your kitchen besides making cheese. So you clean it between times. So you don't necessarily have your cheese making space with these little cultures embedded in everything. Unless of course you don't clean your kitchen. And that's problems that's um, someone asked if, uh, uh, can you use uh, active culture unflavored yogurt as cheese culture? Yes, yes, you can. Um, yogurt is a good thing. I will talk about that when we get to mixed milk, because uh, you you can you can do. I'll talk more about the cheese making process before we get to the history bits. Um, you can use more than one kind of milk in your cheese, and cow's milk obviously is the most readily available to most of us. Um, goat's milk comes next. Um, sheep's milk is as liquid that you can buy in a grocery store is hard to come by in most places. And when you can come by it, it is not cheap. You can buy it here in San Francisco. I don't know about other places where you can buy it, but I know in the Bay Area you can buy it, but it's $11 a quart. And when you use a gallon or two to make a batch of cheese, that is expensive cheese. So much easier if you want some sheepiness in your cheese is to get plain sheep yogurt. You can use any other kind of yogurts that you want to, plain. Don't use flavored yogurts in your cheese making. Flavored yogurts, you, 
other things fine, but not in your cheese making. Um, so goat, cow, whatever. And those do have some cultures, usually, if, particularly if it says on the label that it's an active culture. Um, skier also has active cultures in it because there's more and more in the yogurt section in the grocery store. You can often find skier as well as yogurt. Um, so things like that, quark, if you have that in your grocery store too, any of those things that might have an active culture, yes, you can use those. Kefir also. Um, one of my books, when I talk about the resources, I'll talk about books later. Kefir is another thing that then that is um, a community of microbes that will culture, will culture your cheese. And you can use any of these in combination. I mean, you can put yogurt and some of the store-bought cultures. You can mix them up. You just try it out, see what you get. If it tastes like food that you didn't write. That's one of the things in my cheese making notebook, I have a notebook because cheese is a delayed gratification art. You make the cheese and then you wait. Sometimes weeks, sometimes months. So you wanna have notes as to what you did for when you eat it later as to whether or not you want to try and reproduce this thing or never ever see it again. Um, so uh, you want to write it down, what you're doing. But, and I lost my train of thought. I do that, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the milk can have, you can have um, yogurt in there. You can have different cultures, but if you write down what you did, then you know after you've done it, if it's something you want to do again, or if it's something you never want to try again, because some things go together and some things don't. And everybody's got different taste buds. You may like it. I happen to like cheese that grabs your tongue and says, hi there. I like strong cheeses and not everybody does. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, I was going to segue more back to the milks. Cow's milk, most common because cows, on a per critter basis, produce large amounts more milk than other critters do. They're bigger critters, but they're also been bred to be big milk producers. Goats, because goats, um, goats leave practically anything, so they are easy to raise um, in most environments. Cows are a little picky about what they'll eat, but goats leave pretty much anything. And you know, you can and meet them too after you are done making milk or they just get too ornery. Um, they can go off to freezer camp and uh, be something that you'll eat later. So um, then there's sheep. As I said, sheep milk is expensive. It's hard to find. Oh, but if you can find it, it's worth it. I will assume that as cheese, pretend, cheese makers or potential cheese makers, you're also milk drinkers. If you were to take a glass of whole cow's milk and stick a stick of butter in it, that's what sheep milk tastes like. Don't drink it all the time, clog your arteries. But once in a while, it's a great treat. Um, also, water buffalo. They make milk. There's cheese made out of water buffalo milk. Water buffalo. Um, donkeys. Donkey's milk cheese or ass's milk cheese doesn't sound so good in English. Um, but donkey's milk cheese is the most expensive cheese on the planet. I've never had any. But they don't produce a lot of milk. That is the main reason I believe that their cheese is so expensive is because per crit, on a per critter basis, they make very little milk. Camels, camel's milk, yak's milk, reindeer milk. All of these critters that people raise and milk Pretty much you can make cheese out of it. Um, other mammals too. I mean, there are people who have made cheese out of human milk. That's not very common and I, I don't wanna try that. That's just too weird for me, but um, people do it. But most cheese is made out of the reasonably standard animals that are raised as, her, as pastoral animals. Um, okay, um, let's see, period veggie rennets. There's 
Big Sap. Um, and I have not tried this, so I don't have practical experience, but it is my understanding that with Fig Sap, it's very much, you want the sap flowing. It's like snap a twig off the fig tree and stick it in your milk right away. Um, you, so you, it's, it's the sap, because um, it's when you are dealing with fig trees, they, their sap looks white. So I guess Jewish people thought it looked like milk. Let's stick it in the milk, see what we get. And there you go, it coagulates. We did um, have also, somebody earlier um, bring up fig sap. Yeah. Um, and they said uh, uh, they've used fig sap to co coagulate a fresh cheese. They said when the books say it makes the cheese bitter, they're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of the veggie rennets have the reputation of the natural veggie rennets, not the commercial veggie rennets, have the reputation of making bitter, bitter cheeses. Um, cardoon petals, cardoons, which are related to artichokes. I don't know if everybody's familiar with them. They look like celery. They taste like artichokes and they make these big purple flowers with little teeny petals. And theoretically, if you dry the petals and make a tea with them, you can put that in your milk and it's also a coagulant. Also, um, nettles should make, are supposed to, to make a rennet. I've never tried that one either. Um, but as was mentioned, it makes a bitter cheese. It makes, it makes a bitter, more bitter cheese. These are commonly used um, on the Iberian Peninsula, there are Portuguese and Spanish cheeses that use the, um, the thistle rennets and the other veggie rennets. Um, and often they are very creamy, high fat cheeses. And I think that the creamy high fat kind of is there to counterbalance the bitter. Because, you know, creamy high fat, well, you just put that on pretty much anything it makes better. Um, so I would imagine they may make it with the drier, not high fat cheeses too, but I would think the bitter would not be to everyone's taste. You can buy, um, thistle rennet from the cheese making supply places. I have recently purchased some, I have not yet used it, um, but most of the cheese making suppliers, um, they have a variety of, of animal rennets. They have the modern GMO product veggie rennets and they now also have the thistle rennet. So you'll have a variety of choices or if you or your friends raise animals and delicate slaughter one of the ones before it's, uh, before it's weaned, you can, you know, go terribly old school and make your own rennet out of little animal tummies. Um, let's see, okay, that's that milk. And then we've got coagulants and talked about culture. Let's see what else. Um, there's, I remember hearing several years ago that there was a rumor running around that ricotta's not period. That's bull. Of course ricotta's period. Um, there are illuminations with people obviously making ricotta. There is a recipe in Platina for how to make ricotta. If anybody tells you ricotta is not period, they're wrong. Um, and we had, we had somebody ask, uh, is, the product, uh, is the product called junket made from animal rennet? Can it be used to make cheese? Junket, I have never used junket, so I don't know. Somebody else in the chat, like uh, Evelyn, I believe, is in there. And um, I think um, uh, the late Kim Milt, I think that's her name, the lady from the Middle Kingdom who's good at cheese, I think she's in there too. Ah, here I we go. Evelyn is saying it's a much lighter curd set, better for panna cotta. Okay, so more, more custardy kind of thing um, for junket. I'm not sure what's junk. Evelyn, do you know what junket is made from? Is it a, it's not a rennet. I don't know what to do. But watch the chat. Evelyn will probably have an answer for that because she knows all the good things. Um, ricotta. When you make the cheese, 
I am assuming everybody here has made cheese or wants to try making cheese. When you make your cheese, you get curds and whey, you drain the whey off of the curds, you salt the curds, you press the curds, that's your cheese. You have whey. You wanna use that whey and make ricotta. Ricotta means recooked. So when you're making a batch of cheese, you're going to end up with two cheeses. The first batch of curds and then the batch of curds from your whey when you make ricotta. Um, which is you heat the whey up to a much higher temperature and you get the other protein. You get the, the casein protein is the protein in the curds. The albumin protein is the protein that's in the whey. And when you recook, make ricotta, that's the protein you get. Because there's a lot of food value in milk, that cow or goat or sheep or whatever, went to a lot of effort to get you that milk. You should get as much out of it as you can. Um, and whey, oh look, Celine's, Celine's answering the question on junk and I'll look at that later, but everybody was reading the chat. Selene, so Susan Fox is Selene, she's in page. She knows she's looked up junk yet. Okay, um, let's see. Um, what else did we wanna talk about? Oh, there is a, there are references to cheese being smoked in periods, specifically goat cheese. But if you want to try, if you have access to a cold smoker, obviously not a hot smoker, because then you'll just get a mess in the bottom of your smoker. The grill and it'd be bad. If you have access to a cold smoker or any of the, um, smoker, you know, little appliance things. There's little things where you can stick a, a smoke thing that goes into a bag, into your, to smoke, to do cold smoking. There's all kinds of interesting technology nowadays for smoking things, but make smoked cheese. Um, generally, I find that if you're doing a smoked cheese, you want to do it on smaller cheeses because the smoke doesn't penetrate that deeply. So if you smoke a larger cheese, you're really not getting that much impact on the taste. So you do it on smaller cheeses so that the ratio of outsides to insides is, is more, is closer to one-to-one. -one. Then, then you'll get more smoke flavor if you're do, gonna do that. Um, okay, people have been making cheese for thousands of years. Um, as I said, with raw milk, if you let it sit, um, not hours, like a day or two or three, it will separate into curds and whey because the bacteria that's in that milk, they start doing their little little thing of eating and excreting all of the sugars and the proteins in the milk. And that will separate it into curds and whey because they are making, they are acidifying the milk. The same way with a fresh cheese, you add an acid to coagulate. The bacteria are creating the acid mostly through what they're excreting from eating the sugars, the lactose. Um, so it makes curds and whey all on its own. It's just amazing. And you separate it out, so there you, there's your cheese. Um, so that ancient people, 7,000 years ago, discovered cheese making, even though they didn't know about germ theory and thermometers to have temperatures, is understandable because it was something that would just happen. Um, discovering rennet for a coagulant um, is generally assumed that it's because people used um, the, the internal organs of everybody, you, me, cows, goats. Um, there's a lot of bags in there. And if you're, uh, if you wanna carry liquids of any sort and you are a paleolithic person, or you know, some other uh, less technologically developed society, 
um, that there are these bags right there. All you got to do is, you know, take out all the guts and nasty bits that you're going to eat. Most of them, not all of them. Um, you're making you're making bags, and then you can put your milk in there. And oh, why if I put it in these kind of bags, does it coagulate and makes this oh yummy cheap stuff? I want to eat that. I want to do this more. Um, so raw milk does this all by itself. So this is how people way back when figured it out because it wasn't really hard to figure out. It's figuring out the more, the refinements that get us from those four different things in the formation um, and various other ways of handling the curds to get the thousands of different kinds of cheese. Um, and not everybody can eat cheese, obviously. There are a lot of people who are lactose intolerant. Actually, lactose intolerance is in worldwide human population is normal. That is the standard. Tolerant, being able to tolerate lactose is a mutation in the human genome. One that happened evolutionarily fairly quickly and like uh, there, the estimate is a thousand to, to 2000 years, which is pretty quick for evolution, particularly on a long life species like humans. Um, because if you are able to, con to consume throughout your lifetime, not just as a baby, but throughout your lifetime, this easily stored type of food with lots of protein, lots of carbohydrates, fats, all these good things in it, and you can eat it, and the guy next to you can't, well, you have an evolutionary advantage. So um, mostly uh, this mutation, this cheese eating mutation um, is found in European peoples and European de descendant people, not everyone, but primarily that's where you'll find it. And some pockets in Asia and in Africa, places where there are dairying cultures, um, cultures as in societies, as opposed to cultures like you put in your milk to make the cheese. Same word, it gets you confused sometimes. Um, okay, we have, let's see, my, look at my notes. There's evidence in Turkey of milk production 9,000 years ago. In Eastern Europe, 8,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago in Britain. So as I said, people have been making things out of dairy products, primarily cheese, but other things, butter, yogurt, all those kinds of things. Um, for a long time. Um, Columella, ancient Roman, um, talked about adding herbs to cheese. So yes, besides the four things I mentioned before, you can add other stuff, um, but those four things are the basics. Um, there I have in my notes a picture of a large, large uh, Roman ceramic pot it was used for making cheese. They know because they scrape out the insides and you find little, little bits of cheese proteins. Um, and there's and it's got staples in the side because big pots it break. Big pots will break, and they they put staples in it and to repair it and keep using it. Um, Let's see, that and that big pot was found in in England, but it was from Roman, when the Romans were in, in Britain. Um, let's see, ah, here we go. We've got a, in Wales, in the ninth century, when a, the division of who who owned what in the household, because uh, ancient peoples in some parts of the world were not as um, patriarchal as later on and in other places. Uh, so in some places, women's had certain property rights. Um, ninth century Wales, we've got pigs go to the man, sheep.
go to the woman. The milking vessels, except for one pail, would go to the woman. Um, the man gets the hens and one cat. The women get all the flax and linseed and wool and all opened vessels of butter and open cheeses and as much flour as she can carry with her own hands. Um, and there's another, there's uh, in the Norse sagas in, let's see, does it say which saga this one's in? Uh, if it does, it didn't write it down. Anyway, um, in 1253, Geezer celebrated the marriage between his son Haller at his farm in Flugmore. I love these Norse words. They're so fun. Uh, four days after the wedding, enemies attacked. Geezer was determined not to leave the house and sought refuge in the Kurd room. He shed his armor and helmet, but kept his sword and climbed into a tub full of whey, dressed in his underwear and immersed to his chest in the ice cold liquid. He was hidden by the darkness and the sheltering curd vat on the rack above him. Now nobody wants to eat anything made with that whey afterwards because a stinky guy in his underwear was a little gray. But he did save himself. And it also tells you those curd vats were large, but if a guy can be in there up to his chest, this is a big vat. Um, let's see. Okay, we've got um, Beaulieu Abbey is a Cistercian Abbey in Hampshire in England, um, founded in the 1200s. And they made all kinds of lovely cheeses. They're the account book of Beaulieu Abbey Talks about a cheese being ordered by the monks. It, let's see. Ah, this, they made 11,700 pounds of cheese every year. Now remember that both the manors in England and the, in, and the abbeys were landowners. They had huge amounts of land and the tenant farmers all around there and the tenant farmers would frequently pay their rents in their agricultural products. So if they're bringing all of their milk, all the tenant farmers are bringing their milk into the abbey, then the monks have a lot of milk to make a lot of cheese. Um, some which may have gone back to the tenant farmers, but probably a lot of it just stayed with the monks and with the monks, the people that they visited, that visited to them. Uh, let's see. This abbey, let's see, it says is they were making sheep milk. So they were also, their tenants were probably producing a fair amount of wool along with the, the milk for the cheese. 15% um, of the cheese was reported as waste due to drying out. Um, and out of that 11,700 pounds, only about 3,300 pounds were consumed as cheese. The large part was used in cooking and in pottages. Um, and the cheese was used to feed the lay brothers uh, and, and the monks in the monastery. Um, let's see if we've got another one here about Tudor dairying. Um, Milking the sheep, setting with rennet. It's a 1500 Tudor dairy here. Um, and there's a draining stool and pressing and salting and drying and aging. Um, and then taking the cheese to market to sell at Pentecost. Um, I'm sorry, it should be more organized, but I'm not. Um, cheese has also been found in bogs, just like bog butter. There's also bog cheese. Um, people have been making a lot of cheese for a very long time. Um, so obviously we know that cheese is period, but what kind of cheese? I mean, are there cheeses with names that you would recognize? You could go to the store and I'm going to buy this kind of cheese 
because medieval people ate this kind of cheese. I'm going to take it to the to the event someday in the future when we can have events again. And not only are you having a cheese plate, you are having a cheese plate with period cheese varieties. Woohoo! So even more authentic. Um, we've got one here. Cheshire cheese dates back to 1086 because it is mentioned in the Domesday Book. Um, Cheshire cheese, uh, let's see, it's in, now cheeses, cheeses with particular names. They're usually named for the place where they're made. Just like wine is named for the place where it is made. Um, just because there were cheeses named for the place it's made does not mean that it's made the same way as cheese named by that name. Now, for example, the cheddaring process is, as I understand it, not a process of cheese making that was used in period. That's not to say that there was no cheese made in the town of cheddar in period. It's just what you consider cheddar cheese now. And cheeses made in cheddar in period are different things. But some of them are likely to be similar. Obviously, we have no time machines. We don't know for sure. When we get time machines, um, <laughs> um, okay. Emmentaler, one of the Swiss varieties. Emmentaler cheese goes back to 1293. Um, it is considered Switzerland's oldest and most prestigious cheese. It is named for the Emmen Valley. Emmen and Tall. Tall is valid. So there you go. Um, there is archaeological evidence for cheese making in Switzerland since 800 BC. Um, whether Emmentaler in specific goes back to 1293. Cheese in that part of the world is cheese, but it's not necessarily the Emmentaler to find in the store now. Um, Let's see, making Emmental, Emmental style cheese in period. Cows uh, were milked morning and evening um, and the cream was allowed to come to the top and skimmed to make butter. So remember, you not all cheeses are full fat cheeses. Now and then um, you can get, because if you can take your milk and skim off the fat and make butter, you're making butter and cheese out of the same batch of milk. You get two products you can take to market to sell or consume at home or a combination of both of these things. So um, some cheeses are full fat, some are not. Um, some are skim milk cheeses. And skim milk cheeses mean that that part of the world, they're also, they've also got some butter. Um, Let's see, Emmentalers can range in size from one pound to 200 pounds. Um, and they're, they have holes that this, the culture that they use um, produces a lot of CO2, which is why there's holes in Emmental in Swiss cheeses. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Um, Gouda, Gouda style cheeses. Um, we've got that Goudas and Edoms uh, back to the 12th century. Um, other Dutch cheeses. There is uh, the Ordinance of Cheese Bearers. Um, in the Netherlands goes back to 1593, so still in period. Um, and these are the they, cheese bearers, the guys that carry the cheese, not the guys who make the cheese. There are a lot of, in the Dutch, late period Dutch still lifes, there are lots of cheeses. Um, let's see, and some Gouda cheeses are made with goat milk or cow milk or both combined together. Um, let's see, I have here a timeline for Dutch 
Jesus. We have Gouda sent to Charlemagne. So yeah, Gouda goes back farther than my other notes. To Charlemagne. Um, Dutch bargemen were paying their toll, their barge tolls, with cheese um, in the 1200s. Uh, the city of Harlem obtained the right to hold a dairy market in the 1300s. Uh, Leiden also there in the 1300s got the right to hold a dairy market. Um, So the Dutch have been a cheesy folk for a while here. Um, and they make all the variety of yummy cheeses. Um, Epoise, which is a good, squishy, stinky French cheese. I mean, um, as early as the 16th century, Cistercian monks aged semi-soft cow cheese, um, and they would wash them in, a, in brine and in brandy. Um, so Epoise goes to the 16th century and it would get a um, bit of a reddish mold on it. Molds on cheeses frequently are white or a greenish blue, but some of them also get sort of a, a red. And uh, this is a reference to getting that red mold on the cheeses. Um, let see, Colomella talks about um, curdled milk mixed with honey and olive oil. Um, in Egypt, they mixed soft cheeses with oil and herbs. Um, these make nice soft cheeses to spread on breads and flatbread cracker kind of things. Um, <clears throat> there are several cheese making, period cheese making instructions, which as with many period recipes of various sorts or agricultural manuals go on at length about, you know, humors and other things. But when you get them down to the basics of what they're telling you to do with the milk to turn it into cheese um, are similar to modern recipes of, you know, you take the milk, you heat it up, you add the culture, you let the culture do its little bacteria do their happy thing add some coagulant, let it sit and coagulate, cut it up, separate curds and whey. So the cheese making process has stayed the same. It's just our knowledge of what's happening and why, since we know about bacteria and germs. People in Middle Ages, these things just happen. It makes yummy stuff, I'm gonna eat it. But they didn't necessarily know why. But it's still, it, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just could, uh, could, have, could have cheese and didn't necessarily know why coagulation was happening, why spoilage was happening or not happening. Um, with one of the things, I don't remember whether Evelyn taught me this or it was one of my other cheese making classes, but white mold is food, black mold is not food. So when you're getting mold on your cheese and Greenish blue, yeah, yeah. depends on whether or not you like it. Uh, let's see, Tellagio cheese. Tellagio cheese is another variety that goes back to the 14th century, apparently. There's a mention of it. Oh, nope, 10th century, I'm sorry. Look at the right paragraphs. 10th century, Tellagio. Tellagio is the one that's in sort of a, they're a squarish, they're sort of trapezoidal molds. With, that are so they look kind of like a pyramid with that point topped off. Kind of funny looking in there. They have white mold in there a little bit. Um, I refer to it as brainy. They've got the surface that's all like if you see pictures of, of a brain outside of a head, it's got wiggly lines all over it. Cheeses that have that, that's what I refer to as brainy cheeses. This is an interesting one. Um, pecorino is a period cheese. Parmesan, one of, when you're reading period recipes that call for cheeses, the most frequent specific kind of cheese I've ever seen named is Parma cheese, which is Parmesan. So Parmesan, you know, is period. This is, well, 
um, let's see. You can, um, let's see, what else? Free, because there's free target. Um, Um, oh, I wanted to show you some of my cheeses. This cheese, this is a spreadable cheese. And there's a raw milk cheese. One gallon made five little jars of this cheese. Here we go. Cheese. Really yummy. Smelly. Marvelous. Um, Somebody asked real quick, uh, you mentioned cheese with a red mold. I'm wondering if modern Munster cheese, uh, which has a reddish edge, is a red mold sort of cheese. Yes, exactly, exactly. This is a nice cheese with a good coat of white mold on it um, that I made in May. Probably gonna open for Thanksgiving. Um, this is one I made last month. I'm still waiting for it uh, for the surface to get a bit more uniform once it decides what it wants to be. There's that. See, it's got a little bit of the red on it. It's got a lot of white, a little bit of red, more red down there. Now those two cheeses, as you may have noticed, are kind of the same. That's because I made them both with this. Beautiful ceramic cheese mold made by um, Morgane up in Ontario. She does lovely pottery things. Um, if you're just starting out making cheese and you don't know whether or not it's something you really want to do, so you don't want to invest in molds, that's fine. I mean, new hobbies, you got to try them out, see if you like them. Um, use a couple of yogurt containers or other food safe plastic containers. Get two of them that are the same. Um, and poke holes in one of them, and that's your mold. And the one that doesn't have holes in it, that's your follower for pressing down on it. Um, and you can use that as your mold to try out your cheese. You just wanna poke holes, you wanna poke them out so that when your curds are in there, um, they're not hung up on little fringes of, of the hole or whatever they do, put in there. Um, cheese, there's, a couple of cheese making, SCA cheese making Facebook groups. There's the West Kingdom Cheesemakers Guild and there's the Known World Cheesemakers Guild, which are both good places to go and ask questions when you're making your cheeses. Um, history of cheese. There are not that many things that you'll find on the history of cheese, except this one. This one is really good and it goes into great detail on the history of cheese. Um, and you're all probably seeing it. I'm seeing it It's cheese and culture, a history of cheese and its place in Western civilization by Paul Kinestead. Um, so if you wanna know about the history of cheese in great detail, far more detail than I'm giving you here today, this, this is who you want. Um, if you wanna know about all the different cheeses that there are, this is basically the dictionary of cheese. It is the Oxford Companion to cheese. The Oxford Companion has, um, they've done one for sweets and there's a general one for food. But this one, you can look up all different kinds of cheeses and things related to cheese and they will tell you all kinds of things. They're different. Abbey's in, a, in here, as I was talking about. Abbey's were good places for making cheese. Uh, they talk about different kinds of microbes and Mozzarella, you could tell in the end. Cheese is in different countries. There's a tree here on Sardinia. Oh, San Jorge, San Jorge cheese. They make it in the Azores. Really yummy. Um, if you want to play with raw milk, um, a lot of the cheese making books, the standard cheese making texts, don't talk about raw milk, don't go into great detail and how, how it functions how to handle it, what the recommendations are to do with it. Um, but this guy, The Art of Natural Cheese Making by David Asher. He's marvelous. Um, he makes all of his cheeses with kefir and which um, there's kefir to drink, 
the kefir for drinking is made with little grains, these little, little tiny, well, they're bigger than most microbes because you can hold them in your hand and you see them, um, but it's still not very big. Um, and that is what you make kefir, liquid kefir from, is kefir grains. And I got my kefir grains from this guy because he did a book signing at Common Core Books a while ago. Um, there are some cheeses that you can only make with raw milk. They don't work with pasteurized milk. And um, so if you want to do raw milk, if you have access to it, you want this guy's book. Um, there was in a fact, quick there's, question. Mm -hmm, Sorry. Yes. Uh, how do you recommend cleaning the pottery molds after using them? Oh, um, I just wash them by hand. I, you know, hot, hot soapy water, a good scrub brush. Um, frequently, I will then that's after the cheese making. And then I will frequently do that again before the next batch because in the interim, some little bits, particularly in the holes, because as you can, this is a, you know, this is pretty thick. So those, there's a lot of space in these holes. So that's why you want a good scrub brush. And when you're using the molds, this, Everybody probably already figures it out, but just in case not, you put your mold. I use a, a roasting pan with a rack. I put the molds on the rack in the roasting pan. So when it's draining, there's some place for the liquid that's seeping out to go. You don't want to just have it on the counter because that's a big mess. Um, um, if you want um, the texture of your cheese is all about humidity. If you want soft, squishy cheese, don't press it. You just put it in your molds and the weight of the curds accumulating as you put them into the mold, press themselves. And you don't put a weight on it and press it down more. Um, and you store it somewhere where it's reasonably damp and that will get you squishy cheese. You want hard cheese, you squish it down really, really as much as you can. I have a big granite mortar and pestle and I put that on top of my cheese mold. And you put it in a fairly dry environment and this is how you get cheese that's harder. And if you want cheese somewhere in between, well then you do, it's balancing act between those things. And you can get both of those kinds of cheese out of one pot of curds. If you make a pot of curds and you handle half of them delicately and in a damp fashion where you keep the humidity high, you'll get squishy cheese. And the same one, even though it's the same milk, same culture, same coagulant, you'll get two different cheeses because one is hard because you've squished it and um, kept it dry. And the other one, you've just let it gently ooze out and you have kept it wet. So you can get two different cheeses out of one batch. In addition to the ricotta that of course you're going to make because why are you going to waste the good way? Um, the, oh, on the squishy cheeses, another thing you can do is you can wrap them. Let me show you the picture. I'm going to share my screen and show you some cheese pictures. Cheese pictures. There we go, cheese pictures. This, these guys, this one here, uh, open up. Ah, these are wrapped in leaves. These are wrapped in fig leaves. Um, you can wrap um, fig leaves, uh, grape leaves, chestnut leaves. Um, I don't know what other kinds of leaves would be food safe, but those all are if you have access to any of those. Um, you take the leaves, blanch them to clean them. Um, and then I leave them soaking in, um, in a jar uh, full of booze so that they stay damp and they don't have any unhappy bacterias accumulate until you're ready to use them. And then you just wrap the cheese in however many leaves you need. Um, and uh, that, will, that will get you leaf wrap cheese. This one here. It's purple because I soaked it in red wine. You may have seen, um, it's often called drunken goat cheese 
It's drunken goat. It's purple on the outside because you soaked it in red wine. After you have made your cheese, there's the, the whole going from, okay, the cheese is made to aging it enough that you want to eat it. What happens during that process is you want beneficial molds to grow and not beneficial molds to not grow. One of the things, soaking it in wine. Another one, wrapping it in leaves. There's also putting it in a brine, not wine, but in a brine, so that the edge become, the, the exterior becomes very salty and that would inhibit growth of molds, of molds you don't want. There's molds you do want and molds you don't want. Um, um, there's rubbing it with salt because it's using salts both to salt your cheese and as an abrasive. This is what your curds look like. When you cut them up, curds and whey here. Um, so you rub it with salt and that gets salt in the cheese. It also will, is an abrasive to remove the yucky molds that you don't want. This is a cheese. It was something of a failure because the exterior, it developed a nice, as you can see, a fairly good um, uh, exterior, but it wasn't strong enough when the interior got all liquefied and oozy. It was still tasty. It just was cheese you had to eat right now because it was not gonna age anymore because it had oozed. Um, one of the things that I tend to do with my cheeses is even if the recipe I'm using for making the cheese says I am making Emmental or I am making Gruyere or I am making whatever it is I'm, I'm doing um, or Manchengo or whatever. It is cheese number something. It is not Manchengo. It is not Emmental. That way, if what I have started out with might be intended to be that, but when it's done, if it's still cheese, it may not be the cheese I was aiming for, but if it's still cheese, it's still tasty, then it's okay. That's why the cheeses are numbered instead of named by the recipe. Um, one I've been making fairly often this summer because it's tomato season is I've been making a lot of feta. Feta is easy, feta is yummy. Um, Eden has in here, booze, not brine. I do both, both booze or brine. Um, that's the other thing, besides rubbing with salt, you can also rub it with booze of some sort or soak it um, when it's brandy or something like that. I tend not to soak it with wine. You get you know cheap wine and you can soak the whole thing, but with brandy cost more. So I just get, a, a, put a little bit in a bowl, Get a paper towel, paper towel full of brandy, rub it on the cheese. Um, and th that gets some brandy into the cheese. It also rubs off some of the bad molds. Um, I have never made blue cheese because it is my understanding that once you make blue cheese, all of your other cheeses forever will be blue. And I love blue cheese, but I like to make other kinds too. And I only have one space for aging and I don't want it to be impregnated with the lovely blue molds. Um, if you have ah, aging spaces, that's another thing we should talk about. Sorry, I'm still being rambly, but I hope you're at least being entertained. Um, cheese storage. Um, we have a fridge in the garage that is not as cold as the kitchen fridge uh, where I age Cheeses sometimes. I also we also have an oubliette, which uh, Master Wolfert, who lives downstairs and does charcuterie, um, he and I age. He ages the meat, and I age the cheese in our oubliette, which is sort of a sub basement in the hillside. But we live in San Francisco, which has fairly moderate temperature. If you live in a place with big extremes of temperature, um, a dorm fridge, a wine fridge, those sorts of things, as your cheese aging space would probably be useful. Um, but if you live in a place where it's fairly moderate all year round and you have like 
this is our, our oubliette. It's in the hillside. So it's you know, halfway in underground. So it's, it's cool-ish and damp-ish all the time. Um, and that is our good aging for aging place for cheese. Also has wine and cans. Pickles. We have the best tasting earthquake kit on the block. Um, oh, Kathy Dawson says she also puts them in the bucket with the grape skins from the winemaking. That's a good idea. I like that. Um, the white coating, uh, yes, uh, Lori S says the white coating on cheese is mold, and she, there's a question mark. Just like when you get a nice dry salami, it's got white mold on it. It's the same white mold, which is why aging the charcuterie and the cheese in the same place is good because our molds are compatible both for both uh, activities. Um, let's see, I haven't been paying attention to the chat because I've been yammering at you. So, uh, Lisa, is there any other things in the chat that I missed that I should address or if there's, people have there's just kind of a lot of general um you know a lot of general cheesy, chat there's not a cheesy chatter cheesy yeah chatter. cheesy chatter um okay. I, I would say that uh um my friend uh i have a friend who uh makes cheese and um he actually uses a he got like a small uh rubber made like um garden um like garden storage thing mm -hmm. and put um and put insulating foam all around in the inside of it and it keeps it and he puts it in he has it in his garage and it keeps it cool enough um that it works really nicely for a little cheese cave that's um yeah I have, I have a, yeah i have a friend who uses um has a few ice chests that he has dedicated to cheese aging as cheese aging spaces because they're insulated so they they stay at whatever temperature they started at for a long period of time. Oh, my cheese aging boxes that I have here. As you can see, there's a little mat on the bottom that's removable um, so that there's a little bit of airflow underneath. But also, they're great because they come apart so that when you want it to be dry, what I do is I just put a cloth and hold it down with the rim, and that way there's more airflow. So at the early stages when the cheese may be wetter than I want it to be, I will do that. And then I pop the plastic back in and you can just let it sit on here. Just sit on here or actually snap it down depending on how much airflow you want. Because your cheese is still full of little microbes, which are living, breathing, excreting little critters. So if you shut it up completely, they'll run out of, run out of oxygen and they'll, it'll be full of condensation um, because it is a closed system full of, at least for a while, living critters. But as I said, if you close it up and there's no air, they'll die um, and it'll all get, could, could adversely affect your product. Um, she's making the um, one cheese making book I particularly like. There are a lot of cheese making books out there. Find ones that work for you. But I particularly like this one Artisan Cheese Making at Home by Mary Carlin, Carlin with a K. Because in addition to having really nice recipes that I like, she also has a section in the beginning where she talks about this bad thing happened to your cheese. What went wrong and how to fix it? So troubleshooting bits. Um, also, she has a bit where she talks about the various cultures, what cultures you need to produce, what types of cheese, and which of the cheese making suppliers sell those. So she's got this good chart. So if you want to, it's like, okay. I wanted to make um, this kind of cheese. So you find that kind of cheese on there and it's like, okay, so I want this kind of culture and I can get it from this, these various suppliers. So that's what I'm going to um, But 
as I said, there are other cheese making books out there. Um, and if you want to join the Facebook groups um, and ask other people who do a lot of periodish, yes, Evelyn has it. Yeah, we go, Mary Carlin. And actually, Mary Carlin answers questions when you email her. So that, I like that too. That's another reason I recommend her book is because she's she's helpful. Um, oh, oh, a cigar humidor. Oh, a cigar humidor gauge to get the temperature. Yeah, that would work too. That would work. Uh, somebody asked. Um, could you soak in liqueurs or would the sugar yes. concentration ruin it? Um, it would make your cheese sweeter, but there are period um, instances of honey used in cheese making. So um, sweeter is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so give it a try, see if you like it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that would, uh, yeah. Oh, Maeve also put in there that grape leaves, are good. I thought I said grape leaves, I'm sorry. Grape, fig, chestnut, those are the ones I have used. Um, you wanna definitely make sure that you want leaves that are big. If you're doing leaf wrap cheese, you want, because little ones is just too fiddly and it's a pain. So you want big ones, but you also want ones that aren't going to impart um, either things that are, make it not food or things that make it taste yucky. You don't want it to be toxic and you don't want it to just have bad, bad taste. Um, I would think oak perhaps would be a little too tannic. Tannin is fine in wine, but not so much in cheese. So someone asked, uh, what reference to find a Manchego recipe? Oh, there's a Manchego book recipe in, in Parliament's book. Um, but Manchego is traditionally made with sheep milk. And as I said, sheep milk is rather expensive. You can perhaps substitute goat because goat's more readily available and not as expensive. Unless of course you have a friend who keeps sheep. Oh, I was gonna tell you about water buffalo. That's another thing I missed. Water buffaloes, they're funny. There's, there are three water buffalo um, herds that I know of in Northern California. One, uh, they make gelato and the other two uh, make mozzarella. One of the mozzarella ones, we went to visit their dairy and they um, had you go into the pen where they keep all the young water buffalo because they want them very socialized to humans. Um, and the baby, the, well, not baby, they're not small, they're water buffaloes are like giant dogs. Um, and they behave very much like dogs because they want you to pet them and to brush them. And if they're really happy, they'll roll over and they want you to rub their bellies like a dog. It's just funny, except they're huge things and they'll like push you. Um, the reason they do this is that um, water buffalo being swamp critters, um, their udders retract because you know the water buffalo, if their teats were hanging down in the yucky swamp water, the babies would get sick because they get all these nasty bacteria. So they have evolved that the udders retract into their in, into their abdomen. So they, when they are content, when the mamas are content, that is when they release the udders, and therefore you can milk them. Um, so you want them socialized to humans if you're going to keep them as a dairying animal. Um, so they start them off when they're young, getting them used to people. Um, so that was, I thought that, always thought that was kind of an interesting thing because apparently just like with people, I'm not a mom, so I don't know this for sure, but I understand that there, you know, there's a hormone release when you're feeding your, when you're breastfeeding. When people do that, apparently they're set with the water buffalo too, probably with all mammals, I don't know. Um, but Someone asked it, about it's uh, a happiness, a contentment kind of thing. So it's good. Someone asked about um, they they asked what about Slavic cultures? They Eastern Europeans made cheeses. Um, there is a reference to a particular kind of cheese in the Transylvanian cookbook 
um, which was translated a couple of years ago. Um, if you are unfamiliar with that particular cookbook, um, look for um, Master Gwen, who is on Facebook as Glenn Gorsuch. He is the one who arranged for the translation and has worked with the cheese that is specifically mentioned in that book. If you want specifically a, an Eastern European, therefore most likely Slavic cheese. But yeah, the Slavs made a variety of cheese. Every, all the European cultures pretty much made a variety of cheeses. Glenn is here. He said, oh, one second, here. I'll get it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, excellent. Very good, very good. Very interactive. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, okay, okay. Is there anything I missed? There's areas of, there is a, um, in period, people did all different kinds of divination. We have a lady here in the West who is a Laurel for period divination, okay, different things. Um, divination by cheese is called tyromancy. So that is your silly new word for the day, tyromancy. Um, it was reading the arrangements of the mold on a cheese um, in, in, to divine whatever it is, the answer to whatever your question is. It's, yeah, it's derived from the Greek toros for cheese. Yeah, okay, it was um, shape of the cheese, number of holes, pattern of the mold, or other characteristics were used to prognosticate love, money, or even death. Young maidens in countryside villages would divine the names of their future husbands by writing the names of all prospective suitors on separate pieces of cheese. The one whose name was on the piece of cheese that grew mold first was to be was believed to be the ideal love mate. So, if you have to make up your mind about various uh, <laughs> tasty mancy, yes, <laughs> Axel, you're right, but pyromancy. Ah, Toro is the Hungarian cheese. There we go. So there's your answer on Slavic. So I'll read it out so that people can. Um, so a common Hungarian curd cheese made with cow's milk and an active bacterial culture. It's unsalted and distinctly different than cream cheese, mascarpone, fromage, fraise, ricotta, and others. Milk is Inoculated. Inoculated, thank you, with the acidophilus culture, say from active culture buttermilk, allowed to form a curd while in a warm place for a day or two, then heated indirectly at 200 degrees Fahrenheit for six plus hours. An oven is go a good tool for this. The resulting homogenous curd is then allowed to drain two to three hours. Note for uh, recreators on a budget, pasteurized milk can be used to successfully make this cheese. There's your answer for your Eastern European cheeses, which hopefully covers the question on Slavic. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> and yes, it was tyromancy, not chiromancy. Tyro with a T. T-Y-R-O-M-A-N-C-Y. Um, Anyone else have any questions? Go ahead and type them in the chat if you have questions. Did everybody get all of the ref? I know you've got the Mary Carlin specifics on the books, but um, were there any other of the books that went by too fast that people missed? That they might be and I can also put a list um, onto the, the blog post that's going to go with the recording okay. of the class. So that way everybody can, um, can access that. Did you want to provide a few online resources for cheese making supplies and cultures? Ah, okay, I mostly use either uh, New England cheese, um, which is the big, big one for hobbyist cheese makers, or um, um, what you call it? Uh, the beverage people, because they're 
relatively local uh, to me. They're up in Santa Rosa, which is the north end of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but there are others. Um, and if, yeah, Carlin and Kinestet, the other one was um, Asher. Where did I put? Ah, here we go. The, nap, the raw milk cheese guy, David Asher. This guy. Okay, the list of period cheeses went by fast. We can we can add that I think to the blog post too. Um, besides besides oh, besides the New England cheesemakers and beverage people, does anybody else have uh, cheesemaking suppliers that they like to recommend? Cheesemaking up uh, like places to get the rennet and the cultures and the um, the molds and other, any other cheese making supply. Glen Gary cheese and fromage X. Okay, cool. Um, it is my understanding from Evelyn and Evelyn, if you found different since that um, waxing your cheese is not a period practice as far as I understand. Um, oh, Paul Kinestead. The waxing cheese is not a period practice as far as I understand. Evelyn, is that, yeah, that is correct. Okay, good. Um, it's another way of dealing with the coat of, of the exterior, whether or not you get molds or stuff. But if it's not a period practice and you're wanting to make period cheese or as period as you can. I mean, obviously we can't make cheeses exactly like they did then. We have very different environment and ingredients. For the Hungarian cheese, would the milk with the acidophilus added back in work? I don't know. I've not tried making the Turo. Uh, Glenn, can you answer that? Ah, okay, he doesn't know. Perhaps worth an experiment. Yes, exactly. Yeah, a lot of home winemaking, if you have a home brewing or home winemaking shop, um, in your area that you like, they most likely will also have uh, cheese making supplies. So the whole home fermentation stuff, whatever it is you're fermenting, whether it's beverages or food, um, you can often get supplies um, for one and the other all in the same same locale. So if you've got a wine, wine making shop or beer making shop, ask for their cheese section. This is kind and if of you teach if you teach your local shire or barony how to make cheese, and then a whole bunch of people go in and ask them for their cheese making stuff, they may just have a whole new line of things the next time they go. Because <laughs> look, there's a market for this. We gotta have these too. Um, so this is a uh, kind of a fun question too. I think I'm I'm remodeling my kitchen this fall. It will have many cool features and a lot more space. Are there features I should add related to cheese making? Um, if you can manage a place for aging your cheese, um, like a wine fridges, um, if you want a small, a small spot that wine fridges are frequently repurposed as, um, cheese aging places. And you can still have your wine in there too. I mean, you're not full of cheese, depending on what kind of quantities you want to be making. Um, yeah, I have been making not as much cheese during the pandemic simply because, and I've been making more harder cheeses because they last longer. Because usually I make a lot of squishy cheese, but squishy cheese, you want to eat it more, you want to eat it while it's younger. And since we're not going anywhere, we're staying home, um, there are fewer people to share it with. So it would go off. <laughs> so I'm just been making hard cheese because it ages a long time and don't have to worry so much about it um, going off because there's just my husband and I eat it and I'm big enough already. I don't need to eat hard cheese. They asked uh, wine fridges are standalone, right? Not in, uh, not inserted under the counter. I believe they can be inserted in the counter. Yes. I have seen them as built-ins. 
Oh, that's a yeah. cool idea. I added a hook above the sink so I could hang bags of curds and drain. Yes, yes, that's a good thing. I just tie them to the to the uh, handles on the cupboards. Um, but yeah, the hook over the sink would be good too. Uh, yeah, built in under the counter, it would be more expensive. Um, also, um, as long as there's uh, the temperature regulator and it still works, uh, a dorm fridge, I mean, nobody's living in dorms right now, but um, you know, at the end, at the end of the school year, um, I would imagine there's a lot of dorm fridges for sale for cheap. So if you're trying to do this on a low budget, that might be a, a less expensive way of getting a special fridge. Um, well, as you can see behind me there on my sink, it would be a hook would be under, there we go, there, under the, under the cupboards. But if you don't have anything over your sink, then probably on the ceiling and you'd have to be able to reach it. That might not be so good. Um, I use a, um, as I said earlier, a, my, my big heavy granite border and pestle to press my cheeses. There are, you can actually buy things that are cheese presses. Um, I don't have one, I don't have space for one. Uh, but if you have space, there are the cheese making suppliers will sell them to you or they will sell you instructions on how to make them. Um, so if you have space for it and it's and hard cheeses or something you want to do, squishy cheeses, you don't need them because as I said, you don't press them so much. Yeah, and a standalone Check with your Oh, sorry. I was gonna say you could check with your local woodworkers too. My my partner actually made one recently for a, a friend of ours, a cheese ah, press. Yeah, so. yeah. They're not technically all that difficult. It's just in my case, lack of space. Yeah, and the under the counter, you're right. Under the counter would be expensive, and if they're not under the counter, well, then it doesn't really have to go in your kitchen because you're not looking at. If it's out of sight and out of mind, then the cheese will be allowed to age longer, but if you see it every day, it's like, oh, snack time. Uh, so there's that. Yes, a bunch of cans or um, any other heavy stuff would be, would be, a, can be a sufficient weight. It really depends also on how much uh, how compressed you want your cheese to be. Um, for harder cheeses, I find it's a mortar and pestle this big and it's granite, it, um, so it's heavy. Um, grain meat like a turkey. The hook, you can use the hook to drain drain meat like a like a turkey. Oh. That's what that is. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah. So this is a, a, bunch a variety of small, of small anvils. Anvil. Yeah. 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 That would work too. Um, if you're doing the uh, using two yogurt containers for your mold, um, the second one, the one that doesn't have holes in it, you're using as the follower to press down. You can fill that then with your cans or whatever other heavy thing as part of the pressing process. Cement bag, okay. <laughs> or, you know, a fill it full of pennies. If you got a you know a penny jar somewhere, those are those will be heavy too. Um cheesecloth. I did not mention cheesecloth. Um frequently when you go to the grocery store, at least grocery stores I've seen around here, and they've got something that says it's cheesecloth that is very, very open weave and very delicate it's not at all very strong i do not use that i use chunks of muslin for my cheesecloth um yep small rocks those will work too for your weights um <laughs> yeah barbells barbells they're weights they'll work fine um but for cheesecloth i just use chunks of muslin um 
I have some that are dedicated to that purpose. And before each batch of cheese, um, I, the pot I'm going to make the cheese in, I fill it with water and I put whatever molds I'm gonna use and whatever cheesecloth I'm gonna use, put them in there with water and boil it. Just boil everything um, as the last minute. One more time, make sure it's clean before using it. Um, and with this, my ceramic mold, um, I will line it with the, the chunk, the piece of muslin, and then put the curds in it, and then put this, well, then fold the cloth over it, and then put this on top of the cloth, and then put the mold, put the, um, the weight on top of this, and it squishes it. You can't see it when it happens. Down here on the table in front of me, you can't see it this way. Um, so, and you and I put that all in the roasting pan. So when the whey comes out of these holes, it does not get everywhere. Well, the other thing you can do with whey is you can make um, ghost or mitost. Uh, ghost is made with if you're using goat milk and ghost is cow's milk. Um, you just cook the whey down slowly, like oh, low flame, a couple of days if you got a lot of it. And this, it makes a fudge-like thing. It's not, I mean, it's that consistency. Yeah, flour sack, flour sacks as well as muslin. Yeah, it's just that the, the, the very cheesy cheesecloth, <laughs> Um, I, I don't think it's very good. Um, so I hope everybody has fun with their cheese making. Um, are there any more questions or are we all? Okay. Is that the cooking process, how they make whey powder? For the gyostromitos? I don't know, like the whey powder you get at the, like the nutrition stores, I, I don't know. I think it's dehydrated. Um, so cooking it down dehydrates it somewhat, but I don't know that it's, yeah, the gym nutrition kind of store stuff, whey powder. Oh, another powdered thing, since we're on powder. Um, about a year ago now, I think, my husband found, um, Somebody was selling powdered mare's milk and powdered camel's milk. It was quite expensive, so I didn't get any, but um, I thought it might be fun to add that to whatever other, see if it imparted any interesting flavors to my cheese. I have not yet done that experiment because as I said, they were both rather expensive, but mare's milk and cow's milk, I mean, camel's milk are not things that you come across very often. Um, so I thought that might be fun to try and have not yet done it, but I hope to do that at some point. And if you guys find some of this powdered stuff, I think it, it came from um, Central Asia somewhere. One of the stands, you know, something or other stand in the back of the world. Um, There's actually an episode of Bizarre Foods that talks about, yeah, like mare's milk um, cheeses and stuff. It's very interesting. Yeah, I just watched that not very long ago. So, yeah, and it's from in one of the stands. I don't remember which mm -hmm. one. Yeah, the, I looked up the company online that ha was selling this, and they sell liquid mare's milk, but, you know, it's, it's not something that we... So um, they only sell in person and it's the other side of the planet. The powdered stuff though, can be sugar. Were there any other questions or comments or did, is everybody ready to go out and make cheese? I found it, it's Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan.
I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay. They're ready to go buy more books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always the true true thing about SCA folks. We are always ready to get more books. We don't, may not have room for them, but we always want more books. That's a lot of books today. Just today, whoa. <laughs> Anybody who can't read the chat, somebody said that they're up to almost twelve hundred dollars today. Oh, a hundred dollars, not twelve hundred. Okay. Oh, okay, that's better. Okay. That's better. Yes. <laughs> that's better. Twelve hundred in one day. That's that's that could be fun, but yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for teaching today. This is very interesting. I I may I may give cheese making another try. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and if any of you are having are trying cheese making and uh, come across stumbling blocks feel free to you know message me on facebook or email me or whatever and uh, i will try and help oh and one thing if you're if you make cheese and it just turns out awful nasty yucky stuff but it's still cheese a period of wood glue you add lime the mineral not the fruit to your cheese and this makes wood glue it's not a complete waste. That is a helpful thing to know in my household. Yes. There's a reason that, that, it, that it's Elmer's glue. Because it's from cows. Lime, lime, like, uh, you get it probably. Like builder's it lime. Like, yeah. Like when they do lime wash on you know, all those buildings in the Mediterranean that are white. Lime wash, lime. You can, you can get lime at like the, the hardware store. At the hardware Somebody store, yeah. Lime. yeah, yeah. Cheese and lime. Cheese and lime. Um, it's in um. Canini, I think. In. Um, <laughs> it's a funny thing to kind of end with, is uh. <laughs> Yeah, and it would just make, completely make, make glue. glue. <laughs> make glue. Make glue. Because um, casein, the protein in milk, is a good glue. I mean, milk paint has casein in it. That's why it sticks to wood well. And it's Elmer's glue because with a cow on it, because it's casein. Yeah. Well, that's super interesting. Thank you so much for teaching today. Thanks. This was You're a welcome. really great class. Hope everybody had fun and learned something.